So we better have to quote a single helicity regime. Uh, by the way, helicity is an unfortunate word, which is not the same helicity as the helicity on Taylor, actually. So they are using the same word, but in this case, helicity means the M and N of a mode. Uh, sometimes it gets some, some confusion, but uh, so this is why we, we call them helicity, quasi single helicity. Now, uh, Scars, this kind of, a, of um, spectra were observed in the control room uh, in, uh, intermittently in the experiments, but basically ignored. And uh, I was a PhD student uh, looking at spectra and looking at the soft X-ray tomography, and I had an island there, but I was thinking it was an error, basically. And so uh, <clears throat> it is rather after, after actually gathering and looking uh, at these uh, statistically these ideas and uh, uh, convincing ourselves that it was not an error but still actually something real uh, it, it was actually um, analyzed and we, we, it was seen that these modes were real actually so the, the mode was helical and so one mode was dominant and was increasing but when we had the, 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 the best quasi singularity um, experiments and uh, regimes were at the highest current obtained in RFX, but especially in RFX mode. And I will show you tomorrow uh, which was the, the way to get uh, cleanly to high current because RFX was struggling against the, the, the problem of the locked modes uh, that was uh, um interacting locally with the first wall not allowing to obtain uh, uh, uh the, the low the sufficiently low resistivity to allow to increase the loop voltage and the, and, the, and to increase the current so whenever we get to this high recurrent regime at high longest number we obtain examples of just like here so you, you see a 1.5 mega amp discharge in which uh, when the mode one seven uh, remains sustained for a, for a significant fraction of, of the discharge and uh, looking at it uh, statistically the persistence so the fraction of the time uh, the, the discharge remains in quasi singularity grows as long as the longest number the temperature basically increases and there are some back transitions to mh but they, they, they get less and less frequent what happens is that it is not only a magnetic things, but uh, it is also seen in tomography. So uh, once uh, I begin to, 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 to look at the soft X-ray tomography together with magnetics and correlating with two, the, the two um, measurements, we were seeing that the, the, the position of the structure seen in the soft X-ray tomography, which is located in one polyhedral location, it, it was uh, uh, randomly appearing in different locations uh, uh, from shot to shot. And uh, this was related to the fact that the modes were locked in different locations uh, so from, from shot to shot. In RFX mode, we were able to make them rotate during a single shot slowly. And this is an example shown here in which actually the phase of a mode as measured from outside and the location of the O point, or actually of the hottest point of a soft X-ray tomography seen here, actually they match nicely. That was a one megaamp, 1.1 megaamp. So it was kind of an intermittent QSH, but still, so we have the magnetics and the, and the, and the soft X-ray tomography. That was one of the first uh, um, convincing uh, evidences of QSH helical ones. And then growing in terms of current, we found that there were, were actually two kinds of structures. So these nice structures, uh, which were located in helical structure located inside the plasma, which were occurring in different angles because actually our diagnostics are located in different polyhedral locations. So soft X-ray tomography is 90 degrees apart from a Thomson scattering. So in one case it was up, in the other case it was out. And um, remapping these kind of things, it turns out that it was actually helical with the same helix, uh, the same helicity, uh, the same mode number N as uh, the mode measured by, with magnetics. But what was found uh, whenever we went to a 1.5 megaamp uh, regime is what, uh, that in some cases, with Thomson scattering, this, uh, this is a measurement of temperature along an equatorial plane, were much wider 
than what we used to see in the 1.1, 1, 1, 1.2 mega regimes, which is a narrower. And so we had two kinds of, uh, of, 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 of um, structures. So the wide structures and the, and the small structure. And uh, looking to the Cuencare plot, but uh, I will in the next lesson uh, uh, guide you again to this kind of Cuencare plots uh, done only using the dominant mode. It turns out that the wider the wider structures corresponds to states which are purely helical. So these are not island anymore. So these are called the single helical axes. So these are deformed uh, uh, cylindrical structures. While the narrower one were uh, the narrower one were related to uh, real islands in the sense of one which you can uh, compute with the formula of the small island widths. And these are the, uh, the, the two main uh, transitions. And we will see later how it depends uh, on the mode amplitude. And uh, another important thing that uh, was related to this kind of structure, so the RFP was not uh, actually uh, axisymmetric anymore. It was an there was an equilibrium associated with this kind of structures. And uh, at first, the computing numerically following the field of lines and then adopting uh, the uh, tools typical of the stellarators. So whenever the equilibrium is 3D, we were able to see that the Q profile is not monotonic anymore in the case of the helical structure, but it has a maximum. So it's ironical because actually you want to avoid a maximum, a minimum of the Q, but you end up having a maximum of the Q whenever you get to the higher currents. So it, it shows you that uh, things are really nonlinear and feel it changes uh, in the regimes that you are you are studying. And so the presence of the maximum in Q, it is actually uh, intrinsically related to the helical state. And this is confirmed whenever we were using VMEC and giving you the, it, the, which is the equilibrium code of the accelerator, giving us constraints, the measurement of the, 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 the pickup coil, so the, the helical component and the flux and the current and so on and so forth. And the Q profile to which it converges has a maximum verse and where which is characterized by the fact that the uh, number seven which is the actually the periodicity of this helix is not resonant anymore and curiously actually um the Taylor the Taylor C conjecture came to place actually some colleagues of us asked our, our data and they tried to uh, implement the following idea, which I find it in, in interesting, actually. So if you remember, Taylor's theory supposes that uh, uh, you have your plasma confined uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a perfect conductor and the whole helicity, now the helicity in the sense of Taylor, so A, scalar, A cross J, the, the total integral, is concerned that you minimize the energy and analytically you obtain the, the, the BFM. What these groups, Dennis and others, uh, suggested, they say, imagine that the plasma is separated in different regions and the minimum number of regions is two, and you prescribe the, the helicity and energy separately on these regions. So it is depicted here, basically. So the idea is that you have your, your, your conserver, the flux outside and the helicity outside, the flux inside, the helicity outside, and you have to specify in this theory where the, um, which is the flux of uh, that this determines uh, the region uh, which is, uh, which is uh, actually separated from the other. So basically you assume the presence of a, a transport barrier, which is actually an ansatz. But if you end up, uh, and now it is not analytical anymore, but you have to use a minimizing code, uh, which allows you to compute the, the minimum energy given the constraint of conserving the helicity on these two separate regions. And it turns out that the minimum energy is exactly the single axis, the single helical axis states or the double helical axis states uh, that are found experimentally. And so there are some examples here. And, there is some actually residual chaos or whenever they are going to trace the field lines obtained by their code. 
So it means that uh, there seems to be something in the, the Taylor's theory also in these silica states. And so uh, this is very recent actually result and something which is worth looking at and thinking to. So this was basically with the end. There is many more things, but actually I'm summarizing. And so what we have shown in this first, this first part was that the RFP is a strongly paramagnetic configuration uh, which required the reversal, but it is not consistent with Ohm's law. And uh, the fact that it has been observed experimentally depends on the fact that the plasma wants to become helical or want to become 3D, so or develop some instabilities. And uh, this can be explained uh, or described in terms of a universal curve in the F theta plane with some empirical Bessel function model, which are different kind of uh, explanations uh, so which gives us some glimpse of ideas just to describe the, the experiments but basically we had to rely on the viscoresistive uh, simulations uh, and on global modes so this is what we deal with and one of these global modes actually was uh, responsible of the uh, transition from the multiple helicity to the quasi single helicity states, which in itself then split in two. So the quasi single helicity double helical axis, whenever the amplitude was not high enough, and then the single helical axis. And one of the points is that uh, this can be described not only as a small perturbation, but as an equilibrium. So an helical equilibrium. So the RFP was born axisymmetric, but in, in the end, it can be described as a helical equilibrium with a maximum in the safety factor Q. So this actually, uh, then there are some references of what I, in which we, you can find much more details about the, the, the RFP because we have, there are the free reviews and some early pinch research in the old books and a few books which may be useful for this part. Now I immediately switch to the second part, which is on the transport, in which I'm basically building on this uh, on the two topologies and seeing which were which are the properties of transport, which in a sense are very, very well connected. And so uh, how can you get out of here? which are pretty connected. So distinguishes between equilibrium and transport is some, somewhat ar ar arbitrary in a sense, because they are interrelated. Okay. Transport, but it would be better say it is transport and topology because actually topology changes uh, the transport properties overall, actually. And so in a nutshell, and so if we had to do this lesson in a few minutes, uh, that would be the, the main message. But uh, the core transport properties of the RFP are described in the framework of stochastic fields generated by global modes. But... The point is that the phenomenology is so rich that it cannot be simply um, uh, rephrased in terms of amplitude of magnetic fluctuations so per se. So there is much more uh, richness in regimes. And in some uh, transient experimental conditions, uh, there are ex um, experiments in which this stochasticity is disappearing but uh, they, it happens only uh, transiently. And so now I'm going through uh, just to show some examples. Now, a few, few slides in which I will recall something probably you are very familiar with about basic stochastic transport. I will um, show what we did on, uh, on transport in multiple electricity just to see how the basic... Uh, the stochastic framework works in that regime. And then uh, I will switch to the quasi single LST um, regimes in which transport actually is more complex, in, meaning that you have to distinguish regions. And so the same modes that plays for transport, they also plays for topology. And so uh, it's not so easy to, to, to draw a simple scaling law. 
And the very last part, I will briefly show some results of, on, on transient results in which you actually in some experiments in which these modes are switched to very low level. Now, uh, you all probably all know about the Chirico stochastic instability parameter, which means, uh, which tells you whenever your uh, magnetic field becomes a stochastic. Now, I recall it just to show that it won't work in the quasi single elicity state, or at least it needs to be modified. It always works, but, uh, we, we, but you have to be dealt with uh, some care. So the basic idea, that, as you all know, that if you have to neighbor island uh, opened by no matter what kind of resonant perturbation, say, can be a magnetic instability, a field error, a very fine scale grain turbulence, no matter what, uh, if they overlap, so if the, the, the distance, the half distance of the two uh, islands uh, is less than the distance, uh, you have distinguished these three regimes. We, whenever they are not overlapped, they are actually uh, only uh, distorting field lines. Even if inside the island there may be some, some, uh, some transport, and so the island may be flat itself. So it may, in, in any case, influence transport. If they are barely touching, uh, uh, magnetic field lines are weakly stochastic and there may be some remnant structures and I actually I will show you that we have measured some kind of this kind of, of, of structures in some regimes and whenever they are much greater than their distance in principle in the region of a fully stochastic uh, regime you are and then um, magnetic field lines wander stochastically and they flatten every every gradients and this is the regime in which uh, Register Rosenbrod actually derived its famous formula, which has been used for years uh, whenever no uh, direct uh, in thermal diagnostics available. And it was used as a scaling just to, to assess the transport. Now, in the case of the RFP, the resonant uh, global modes, uh, in fact, the Terry modes uh, are the ones responsible for generating this stochasticity. And due to the Q profile that I've shown you, uh, if the amplitude of the modes is sufficiently high, these islands may overlap, especially in the region uh, near the reversal surface in which uh, we have a packing of, a, of a rational surfaces. And um, so it is more and more easy to, to, um, to, um, uh, to, to, to overlap and to get the Chilicon criterion going much higher than one. Now this figure I will show you later, later on. Now, the point is that, uh, which is basically the, the, the mechanism of uh, the stochastic uh, um, transport, it is based on the stochastic instability of intrajectories. I am mentioning it because actually it has been used by our colleagues and by my, my group also, just to um, map directly the field lines and uh, to compute uh, the the, 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 the diffusion itself, because actually here in the case of Register Rosenblum, it uh, su supposes that uh, the average displacement uh, is described by a diffusion formula, which is valid whenever you have uh, fully developed turbulence. Uh, and so it is an approximation that can be done. There are plenty of regimes that should be taken into account. Uh, but the idea is that you have this divergence, uh, uh, this exponential divergence of lines, basically. And so you have this, uh, this uh, coefficient. So for an experimentalist, this is a number. This is a coefficient that scales with something that you have to want then to compare with our, with our measurements. And uh, the point is that whenever you have the, the field lines that are actually uh, diffusing, uh, the particles will follow because actually transport uh, along the lines is much faster, 10 to the six times typically than the transport perpendicular. And then you have this scaling formula in which if you assume that the transport is local, which is a strong assumption in any case, but uh, in the fully developed uh, uh, turbulence you, you can do it your transport coefficient depends uh, basically on the scaling of the of the fluctuations to the square to a, some auto auto correlation length to the temperature of a particle so uh, the the lower the radial perturbations uh, the lower the transport and the scalings basically that experimental were measured we're trying to seek this kind of, of dependence 
and also uh, the transport is low if the field is weakly stochastic. Now, uh, with the advent of a high resolution uh, spatial diagnostics, uh, we tried to basically uh, compute the effective coefficients and compare with stochastic theory. So by carefully measuring uh, temperature, density, uh, reconstructing the, the, the profile of the current uh, with the uh, models that I've shown you in the first lesson, we were able to obtain um, estimates and profiles of uh, chi effective uh, with, with, with so-called power balance technique. So assuming, uh, so uh, say stationary condition, and as an example is shown here, basically in the, in the core, uh, there is a huge uncertainty. So this, this, this is shown here, but you see that the, the, the uncertainty by varying a little bit with Monte Carlo varying the various parameters were such that uh, the estimate was meaningless. There is a minimum near the, near the core, the, near the edge. And this is typical. So the, the RFP confinement is basically minimum in, in an edge region, which is nearby where the reversal surface is located. And there is a region on which you have some chi here, so the chi core, where there is some residual gradient. Clearly, these are multiple elicity, so uh, some, some strong turbulence. This number compares with uh, Rochester and Rosenbluth and our colleague in uh, Madison basically reconstructed and recomputed uh, the um, magnetic field lines uh, starting from um, the eigenfunctions so the radial perturbation uh, reconstructed with an MHD viscoresistive code um, they did it with the disco resistive. We did uh, with a linear analysis. Uh, in any case, in both cases, we had to rescale this kind of, of line of um, measurements in order to match the, the external measurement. So uh, we had to rely on the measurement of the, 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 the magnetic field perturbation at the edge. And feeding this kind of lines inside a field line tracing code, a Poincaré plot like this one uh, was obtained. And by the way, in the paper, they do not uh, actually notice that there, are, there is an, an N equals six island here. And later on, they admit that this is a QSH, but they, they focused on the region in which uh, fields are, are stochastic. And in fact, what they did was they did a power balance, just like we did in RFX. And so comparing uh, obtaining uh, an effective value with, with, uh, with a similar uncertainty, which is the gray area, due to the fact that whenever the temperature has no gradient, it's difficult to estimate uh, the, the, effective, um, the effective chi. And we compared with uh, stochastic in two ways, by the simple application of the Rochester and Rosenberg formula, so using the square of the fluctuations and estimated uh, the autocorrelation length uh, with the field line tracing. And uh, it is shown here, basically. So it basically is, it is in the gray area in the region where the, the um, Chirikov parameter is rather high. It doesn't work inside, so into the core, whenever actually there is some actually uh, uncertainty, but uh, there is also the remnant islands, uh, the QSH, and it doesn't work at the edge. But in this case, because they were not using eigenfunctions to, to deliver, uh, to, to obtain stochasticity in that region. In any case, I will show that uh, the Q equals zero act as a, a barrier. So there cannot be stochasticity unless in some toroidally localized region, I uh, will show. So the message here is that uh, in multiple elicity, uh, the um, transport is, is chaotic in, in between, not in the core and not, and not, uh, and not in the edge. Uh, the fact that it works, but not that much, uh, was also retained but when looking at the scaling uh, with the magnetic fluctuation. So in RFX, we were able to uh, gather the chi effective averaged in what is this written core in the paper relates to half radius. So basically where uh, the, the chi is, is meaningful. 
and uh, by um, considering the, its dependence uh, with respect to several um, um, ensembles and in which the Lundquist number could be estimated, it turned out that uh, there was a, a scale independence with this number, minus 0.77. Simultaneously, it was possible also to measure the scaling of the uh, magnetic fluctuations, so minus 0.8. In principle, if the Rosenblut hold, uh, the chi ratchet Rosenblut would be minus 0 0.36, which is a weak uh, dependency. Actually, that was thought the uh, motivation why RFP doesn't work as a scaling for a reactor in NH. But experimentally, actually, it is much steeper than that. It's a factor of two, basically. And um, that's 99. So in these ensembles, there were some QSH in, hidden inside. So it, it, it tells you that whenever you do some scaling uh, without knowing exactly what is inside your data, you can mix up things and obtain different scaling laws. So it was a first indirect, indirect in, um, indication that there was a change of regime. So scaling should be always taken with care. Transport in V, uh, let me close it. Transport in the edge is not stochastic and that was proved uh, with some direct insertable probes by our colleagues in Madison. Uh, in which we used, uh, we actually measured the, the parallel flux, the Q parallel fluctuations. They measured the radial field, so directly, so without you know, not being mediated by some uh, uh, Fourier analysis. And it turned out that inside the reversal, uh, it was com compatible, which was what coming with the, the ohmic flux coming from, from the core, while outside it was not. Uh, it, it was negligible basically. So other mechanisms, so electrostatic uh, fluctuation were responsible for transport outside. So uh, the Q equals zero surface uh, act as a weak barrier in a sense. Why don't you? But the point is that even in MH, uh, the transport in the, um, uh, in the axisymmetric, um, in, in, the transport in the edge part uh, of, of the discharge is not uh, is not symmetric. And this is a, a figure taken from a paper in which um, uh, um, magnetic ma ma magnetic profiles taken from a viscoresistive uh, uh, simulation by the special code, which is located in Padova, just to illustrate. Uh, Someone asked me which was the, the structure of M equals zero modes. Uh, and this was actually an, uh, an experiment, uh, actually a thought experiment. So it's, uh, it's only, only theory. So instead of using all of the modes, uh, three Poincaré plots are shown here. And so in the first, uh, in the first row, it is a Poincaré plot used, uh, um, performed by using only the M equals zero modes produced by this mode, which is a, a cylindrical mode. And so these M equals zero modes uh, do not show, do not do any chaos because actually Chirikov does not, does not apply whenever all of the modes are resonant or exactly on, on the same surface, but you have a modulation. So you have several rings uh, with different shapes and they are there. The second, it is also very interesting because whenever you uh, do a Poincare plot with only M equal one modes, you still see M equals zero structures or islands. And these are due to the fact that these, these, that these M equal one modes interact themselves with equilibrium. And so there is some structure. And as these modes are phase locked, as I shown at the beginning, all the phases tend to be aligned in this code, they are aligned in zero. There is this barrier effect due to this M equal zero structure in everywhere but where all of the, the N equal ones are pushing the, 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 the lines, the magnetic field lines away. And so the, there is a region in which the lines can escape from inside to outside. And the last one is a Poincare plot in which both of them are present. So in a multiple helicity, we have remnants M equals zero islands and 
uh, through the, the X points of these islands, there may be some islands getting out of there with some different kind of connection length, connection length. And up to 2006, uh, these were only, uh, say, uh, numerical calculation, but some measurements were performed later on. And uh, in a regime in which RFX operates at lower current, allowing us to insert probes inside the, inside the machine, um, it was possible to measure simultaneously with probes and with the Thomson scattering uh, an M equals zero island, an edge M equals zero island, which is shown here. So here you have a, a Poincaré plot showing uh, uh, in red lines belonging to this island. And uh, <coughs> that is performed at the time at the Thomson scattering fires. And the temperature in this line, it is fairly flat, basically, and corresponding to the, the, the location where the, the island is located, while outside is much higher because it's going higher to, toward, the, toward the center. These probes also allow to measure the electrostatic flux in terms of uh, the uh, particles. And uh, Reches and Rosenbluff give some uh, uh, estimate which is lower than uh, the measured uh, stock uh, the measure electrostatic flux so another indication that in the edge outside the reversal transport is electrostatic is not uh, stochastic any anymore and also power balance was actually performed whenever a gradient was there with numbers in, in which which were such that chi over d was of the order of a square of a a ratio between may, um, ion to electrons, so consistent with stochastic. So these are the two takeaways of transporting multiple helicity. While whenever we talk about quasi single helicity, things are different. So um, a paper that anticipated uh, this effect uh, was uh, actually published in 2000. Uh, so uh, seven years before discovering actually the, the real single helical states. And the idea that it um, brought about is fairly simple. So it tried to say, okay, let's, let's, let's take a numerical um, viscoresistive uh, simulations, which gives us a single helicity. It used to be, but they had this kind of simulations, but they were thought as a, a, of academic interest because actually no one ever saw uh, single helicity pure stationary in uh, in the experiment and so they took uh, the, um, the the magnetic field uh, 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 as obtained by this simulation and they tried to compute the uh, to apply the chirikov criterion and so it is shown here in the this is taken from the paper so it was an n equal 11 it was not a perfect simulation actually it was not a realistic because uh, the, the the helicity what it was not like like the one of the experiment, but it is the idea that matter. So there was a significant strong overlap. So Chirikov was way higher than one in a couple of regions. But uh, then they tried to do some field line tracing in this case, and the field line tracing was still showing some order. So the n equal 11 was still remaining here. So there were bands of chaos, uh, but modulated with an n equal fun, n equal 11. And so region of chaos separated from inside to outside. And uh, when they took the spectrum and synthetically, so arbitrarily say, reduced by a factor of 10 only the, the dominant mode, and so basically reducing the Chirikov parameter and so going to a less chaotic situation according to the standard, uh, to the standard idea, they ended up in a Poincaré plot uh, like this one, which was way more chaotic. We having so only some remnant of the 11, uh, uh, the n equal 11 here in white and some of n equal eight here. So having a, some kind of a paradoxical effect. And uh, the explanation of the paradox was actually explained in terms of the topology of a magnetic field as generated by the dominant mode alone. So uh, if, you, if you discard all of, the, all of the others and you perform a Poincaré plot by using only the dominant mode, it turns out that whenever this dominant mode is low, 
uh, it is on the left and so it is actually uh, generating an island which is characterized by an O point an X point and there is also an O point which is the, the residual magnetic axis of the equilibrium uh, as long as you increase the amplitude of this mode the the two the O point the the O point of the magnetic axis of the or, or the original one say of the unperturbed one and the X point gets nearer and nearer and at a certain point they coalesce and they merge together and uh, you obtain what it is called a single helical axis so and this is the, the why uh, reducing the field was generating more chaos because the presence of an X point uh, now for the for the guys who belong to the Hamiltonian club to which I do not belong they 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 think that it is very common to understand that in the, whenever in the orbits there are x points this is very easy very prone to chaos so whenever you have some perturbation this may may grow while whenever the x point is expelled from your system it is more resilient to chaos and this is what seems to be happening also in the experiment in fact these transport barriers, as I mentioned at the beginning of the double axis and single axis, were actually found in the experiment. And uh, <clears throat> while at the beginning we had the Thomson scattering measurement showing just like in this black curve, uh, which was uh, actually only one or from one part or from one side of the magnetic axis of the island uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the chamber. Uh, it happened that sometimes we had these wide, these wide things. Um, extending way uh, above the, the magnetic axis, so from, the, from, the, from both sides. And when correlating with the amplitude of the dominant mode only, it turns out that there was a threshold. So thermal structure, wide thermal structure, were obtained whenever the mode was above a certain threshold. Actually, this began to occur, uh, to be observed, uh, uh, in the last part of uh, of the uh, of, uh, of RFX mode, in which some of the diagnostics were beginning to fail, so now the, the things are patchy because actually uh, some campaigns have some diagnostics, some other campaigns have some other diagnostics. So whenever we had a new diagnostic and a new campaign, it turned out that the situation is even much more complex than this, and this is a very very recent recent paper in which. Uh, it turns out that not only the dominant mode determines whenever you have a, a wide or a narrow structure, but also the secondary modes, but not all modes are equal. So by analyzing, um, so performing a lot of Poincaré plots and looking at the structure width and correlating with the amplitude of the modes, it turned out that uh, reconstructing much better the equilibrium, also, what we thought of too, that uh, they were double helical axis structure, actually they were already shaxes. So it seems that the transition from a thermal point of view, the structure remains narrow, even if uh, the X point has been expelled. And only at a certain point, uh, it gets wide. And why it happens? It happens because the, innermost um, resonant mode remaining because in the Q profile that as I mentioned has a maximum so the seven is not more there but the eight and nine in our case are the ones which are still there when they decrease to such a level that they are not stochastic anymore they can allow the, the, the structure to widen and so this, these points here, so this white structure are correlated to the fact that the n equal eight and equal night amplitudes are decreasing as long as the amplitude of a dominant mode is increasing. So these cases are the ones that are the one what we show. So even if we have this magnetic wise huge structure, dominant mode, so in a sense, stochasticity, stochasticity is still playing a role, but in a, in a complex way, let's put it this way. In fact, whenever you do some power balance, also in, this, um, in these cases, so uh, 
remap the temperature, not, not you're not as systematic anymore, but you have to remap in this helical in helical coordinates of a single helical axis. And you see the, the minimum chi, which occurs where, 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 where the, the barrier is, is located. It do scales with secondary modes. So this, this, the dominant one should be taken off. And so it, in a sense, it reminds the ratchet the ratchet scaling, but only concerning the dominant modes or the only the, the modes relevant for the location where the barrier is located. And so, okay, this is a summary of what uh, uh, we have seen, uh, we have observed. So dominant modes matter, but uh, dominant plays a different role. Subdominant plays a secondary role and the, all of the others determine the, the transport. Now, let me conclude with a few slides on uh, uh, the current profile control techniques in which uh, our colleagues from Madison tried to switch off to reduce the second the, the stochasticity by switching off all of the uh, all of the mode by driving current from outside. And as I mentioned, the idea is that if uh, uh, you drive some poroidal current instead of relying on the plasma, uh, you do it from outside. The, the, the RFP can be sustained without relying to the, its self-organizing mechanism, be it uh, multiple ST or single ST or what else. And clearly in doing some ad hoc simulation, this resistive when we, you had uh, this, uh, you, had, you had this current and you do a point carry plot, you clearly end up that these modes are stable. And so uh, transport is expected to be much better, but clearly this is ad hoc, this is not, uh, uh, in reality. Now our colleague tried, uh, now this is a busy, busy slide, uh, but uh, they, they tried with different approaches. So they tried inductively, they tried uh, with uh, electrostatic insertable chrome currents, uh, and also with waves. Uh, the most successful one was the one with inductive, which unfortunately is transient. And also in RFX, we did it, uh, and it is called the oscillating polar current drive, the toroidal field, instead of uh, going down and then uh, ending the discharge, uh, it is uh, repeated. Clearly, there is a good part in which you have the, the polar field, uh, the, 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 drive, the current is driven in the right direction, and then there is a bad part in which actually you, you recharge it. But it, it worked, uh, at, at least in, in the low current. And now there are many over that you can find in, in, in the review. But now I'm focusing only on the most successful one, which was the fast parallel, parallel current drive. And the, the first measurement that they did is that, as expected, uh, whenever you, uh, you, you drive current from the outside, the Ohm's law is matched. So they measured the parallel current and the eta j square, while in the standard case, uh, as in the parametric pinch, as I showed you in the first, uh, in the first slides in the first lesson, they are unmatched. So there is a less, uh, there is much, not much less in the core and differently at the edge. In the PPCD case, at least in this transient phase, they are pretty much matched. So no current is required from the plasma and in principle no dynamo field is is required and this is a time trace here basically so you see that the b5 is reducing in in time so there is a pass there and so what happens is that the, the root mean square of, uh, of fluctuation so global modes do decrease during that good phase and while they recover whenever you are in the anti ppcd phase and uh, these modes go down to such a low level that uh, by tomography, I was in the control room that time, I remember that I, I saw the traces there. Uh, whenever uh, you, you do not stimulate the QSH, which happens uh, uh, often, but in the case in which you do not happen, you do not stimulate it, uh, multiple tiny islands appear in the fluctuation pattern beating because they are rotating at different velocities. Uh, and clearly indication that uh, the, the magnetic chaos is very, very decreased. While in, in, while in RFX, uh, typically the OPCD, which is the oscillating, the oscillating part of this kind of, the, of um, behavior was such that the dominant modes was decreasing and the, 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 the secondary modes decreased and the dominant mode increasing. 
and getting the higher temperature. And our MST colleagues also actually saw that uh, temperature significantly increase. The chi clearly go down to say 10 square meter per second and concerns electrons while ions are pretty much unaffected. So this is something to be understood. Then they add some kind of uh, um, different experiments trying to have to increase the ion temperature. And it found that the, the temperature scaled with amplitude of the modes located clearly near where they are more densely packed, where some residual magnetic chaos was uh, still uh, going on. And I think that's it because actually uh, I squeezed a little bit just because it was too long. So in essence, uh, stochastic trampos still apply to the RFP. Uh, in a multiple elicity, it uh, amounts uh, for it, it's, it's, it's an important loss uh, channel. In quasi single elicity, actually, it, it it still is stochastic, but uh, the various modes uh, have uh, different roles uh, in uh, changing the topology. And so the dominant mode, the subdominant modes, and the, all, all of the secondary modes. So still scaling, but uh, who knows? We Maybe we are in, in a regime in which uh, something else is going to change because actually, as I show, Transport is not axisymmetric, so there is this region of locked modes uh, which may connect uh, the edge with the wall. Uh, if uh, the amplitude decreases and these connections get closed, who knows what may happen. And what would could, what can happen was shown by transiently by these current profile control techniques in which actually these modes are decreased transiently and showing that chi can, re can be reduced to very low level. I'm closing it. Because there are so many things to say. Thank you. So, any stochastic question? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions on, like, let's say, the uh, CD which we dispose to port. What mm -hmm. kind of source uh, key is that in the module? The point, this is the, exactly the point that we are struggling with, say. For the experimentalist, uh, viscosity is a number. They plug it, they do their, their simulation, that's okay. And then they tell us, okay, measure it. And that's a different issue, obviously, because they actually there are various kind of, uh, of uh, say, approaches. Um, what our colleagues in medicine have done is just taking, not looking at the metric code, but looking at the breaking curve of the, of, of the modes, because they have the modes rotating, but they tend to be connected to the plasma. There is a torque balance between the, the flow and the breaking by the, the shell. I will talk about tomorrow about the torque balance and the locked modes. And by measuring this curve, um, it depends on the amplitude of the, of the viscosity parameter. And in some cases, it seems that it can be better represented by stochastic viscosity. And so it is not Braginsky. But then it is the perpendicular one, the parallel one, and not really expert. And so the point is that we are eager in our effects mode to start again experiments because from the beginning we were forbidden this kind of experiments because modes were locked from the beginning so nothing rotates so you cannot measure anything in our effects mode too in principle these modes will be rotating so we would now we have much better diagnostics in principle we can measure and estimate this viscosity but okay yes and the global modes. Global. The global modes. Huh? I call global modes, but actually they are Terry modes, dynamo modes. So the, the M equal one and usual modes. Yes. Okay. What's the question? There are, of course, maybe maybe I have the wrong. I may be wrong. Uh, in the space uh, plasma. Uh, yes. In the solar wind, uh, there are kind of global modes. Uh, uh, so oh, good point. All of the simulations typically are zero pressure. 
So all of the species the simulations are still pressure. They are trying with uh, PIXI 3D with other codes to introduce pressure and transport, but it is a nightmare of all instabilities that we have to stabilize them. The DEBS code has some pressure, but for sure it is isotropic, pretty sure. Whenever you switch on beta, there are so many waves going on that uh, I've seen that they are not using uh, so often. So basically all of the MSD results that they have found so far are zero beta. Yes. Yes. And this you also know about the we are curious too actually. so the point is that uh, we, um, we are building a, uh, an experimental database and idea so in some cases uh, in MST they seem to be uh, to have some behavior which reminds of ITGs or and they are doing some kind of geokinetic simulations but uh, uh, we do not have such such a solid database of experimental evidences uh, that we can say, okay, we are getting into that regime. Because actually, what uh, what what we have trying to to see is that the gradient of the temperature, or even in this gradient, normalized gradient, scales with the secondary, the global secondary modes. But this is how whenever you lose your key, you look uh, below the lamp, whatever you see. So because this is what we measure. Uh, in RFX module, we will have a wider an, uh, array of, of, of um, pickup sensors and resettable sensors. So we will look at wider, um, say, MHD uh, fluctuations, uh, lower uh, lower time scales, and we, we will try to see. But so far, we we basically do not know. We have some indirect evidence in, in the, in the uh, there is a couple of figures in the review, in which maybe the effective chi may be consistent with some kind of geokinetic uh, computation in the, the very edge of the figure probably but who knows any other questions if not then we will thank you Leonardo. thank you and, uh, so some, somebody reminded me that I'm supposed to be talking this afternoon. Is that true? That's right. So what I will try to do then is to give you um, some kind of a physical